Seeing Jesus through the lens of the spiritual revolutionary is powerfully transformative, if we can embody that spirit within ourselves, we can begin to break down the internal walls that separate ourselves from each other, from the world, and from our own divinity. There's just a simple, profound intimacy with all things, and with all beings, and with that which transcends all things and all beings. Life is experienced in all of its original completeness and unity. I think the churches in this country need to be revitalized, they need that challenging presence of Jesus that says, it's important that you realize the truth of your being. There are profound consequences to living in darkness. As Jesus says in the Gospel of Thomas, if you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. Relinquishment is what spiritual teachers mean when they say, die before you die. There is a freedom that can be discovered in relationship, whether it be with spiritual community or with another individual, where something much bigger than any individual is born. What I am speaking about is an intimacy that flowers in the presence of truth. The depth of this intimacy can be a vehicle through which oneness is experienced. For some, this degree of intimacy is positive beyond belief, for others, it is the cause of mistrust and fear. True intimacy always threatens the sense of separateness. The very last phase of spiritual awakening is what I call the transmutation. Transmutation is what transfiguration and relinquishment make possible. In it, your orientation to life is entirely selfless. It's not that you want to be selfless or you're practicing being selfless, rather you're selfless in the sense of no self. Spiritual autonomy is knowing who and what you are, knowing that you are divine being itself, knowing that the essence of you is divinity. You are moving in the world of time and space, appearing as a human being. But nonetheless you are eternal, divine being, the timeless breaking through and operating within the world of time. To Jesus, spirit is everything. Nothing matters more than spirit or, as I like to say, divine being. Divine being is what Jesus is here for, it is the vitality source from which he moves, from which he speaks, from which his critique arises. He is the living presence of divine being. He's a human being too, but he's here to convey divine being, and that comes out most clearly in the Gospel of Mark, imagine if you took it on in yourself to reorient your life trajectory toward your divinity. Your divinity, I so love the world, that I gave it all of myself. There is a scripture in the Buddhist tradition called the Heart Sutra, which says that there is no birth, no old age, and no death, and no end to birth, old age, or death. This is a very important part of the sutra. There is no birth, no old age, and no death. This is true from the absolute point of view. But unless we've also realized, simultaneously, that there is no end to birth, old age, and death, then our realization is not complete. The truth, I would suggest, is that you poured yourself willingly into form out of infinite love in order to redeem the entirety of this life. When seen from that perspective, all of a sudden life looks very different. You stop holding back from life, your inner life or the life around you, because the kingdom of heaven is within and all around you. That's the message of the Jesus story. As we go through life, we eventually have enough experience to see that sometimes profound difficulty can also be profoundly heart-opening. When you are in a tough position, when you are facing something hard, when you feel challenged, when you feel like you are at your edge, it is a gift to be willing to stop, to sit with those moments, and not look for the quick, easy resolution for that feeling. It is a kind of grace to be able and willing to open yourself entirely to the experience of challenge, of difficulty, and of insecurity, Jesus said, blessed is he who came into being before he came into being. Allow your suffering to speak our suffering consists of two components, a mental component and an emotional component. We usually think of these two aspects as separate, but in fact, when we're in deep states of suffering, we're usually so overwhelmed by the experience of emotion that we forget and become unconscious of the story in our minds that is creating and maintaining it. So one of the most vital steps in addressing our suffering and moving beyond it is first to summon the courage and willingness to truly experience what we're feeling and to no longer try to edit what we feel. In order to really allow ourselves to stay with the depth of our emotions, 
we must cease judging ourselves for whatever comes up. I invite you to set some time aside, perhaps a half an hour, to allow yourself simply to feel whatever is there, to let any sensation, feeling, or emotion come up without trying to avoid or solve it. Simply let whatever is there arise. Get in touch with the kinesthetic feeling of it, of what these experiences are like when you're not trying to push or explain them away. Just experience the raw energy of the emotion or sensation. You might notice it in your heart or your solar plexus, or in your gut. See if you can identify where the tightness is in your body, not only where the emotion is. But what parts of your body feel rigid? It could be your neck or shoulders, or it might be your back. Suffering manifests as emotion often as deep, painful emotion and also as tension throughout the body. Suffering also manifests as certain patterns of circular thinking. Once you touch a particular emotion, allow yourself to begin to hear the voice of suffering. To do this, you cannot stand outside the suffering, trying to explain or solve it. You must really sink into the pain, even relax into the suffering so that you can allow the suffering to speak. Many of us have a great hesitancy to do this, because when suffering speaks, it often has a very shocking voice. It can be quite vicious. This kind of voice is something that most people do not want to believe they have inside them, and yet to move beyond suffering it's vital that we allow ourselves to experience the totality of it. It's important that we open all the emotions and all of the thoughts in order to fully experience what is there, as soon as you break your fidelity to truth, you kick yourself out of the freedom of truth. As soon as anything, power, praise, person, place, thing, outward love, respect, acknowledgement becomes more important than truth, you will begin to suffer and feel separate. There is only room for truth in the truth. This means there is only room for seeing the truth, choosing the truth, and loving the truth. A fierce commitment to truth is a moment-to-moment -moment choice. The heavenly state is the context of eternity in which the world resides. When someone tells you, I love you, and then you feel, oh, I must be worthy after all, that's an illusion. That's not true. Or someone says, I hate you, and you think, oh, God, I knew it, I'm not very worthy, that's not true either. Neither one of these thoughts hold any intrinsic reality. They are an overlay. When someone says, I love you, he is telling you about himself, not you. When someone says, I hate you, she is telling you about herself, not you. Worldviews are self-views, literally. Just as your lungs breathe in and then breathe out, it's necessary for things to fall away so that life can breathe new again. This is one of the laws of the universe, that everything you see, taste, touch, and feel will eventually disappear back into the source from which it came, only to be reborn and appear yet again, receding again back into the source. This is what the virgin birth signifies, time and space being opened up and eternity being embodied as a human being. This is you and I, yet we don't know it. We are eternal, divine beings manifested here and now in our humanity as a particular human being. Our human form comes from the pairs of opposites. The body that feels, the mind that thinks all this comes from the pairs of opposites. Your mother and father got together and produced a baby, a beautiful, incarnated being, and that being is filled and animated by the vitality of divine being. That is the beauty of what the virgin birth signifies if you can read the metaphor. The light of awakeness itself is the deepest transformative agent. And the deepest alchemy takes place in the willingness to stay conscious to our own unconsciousness. Thinking is something and then feeling it are two different reference points for most human beings, if I think it and I feel it, then it is real. But it does not take much reflection to acknowledge we have all thought and felt things to be true that later found out were not. The thought is not the thing that it represents. Try to get that right down to your core, right down to the marrow in your bones and into the blood that flows through your veins, the thought is not the thing. Then embrace that intermediary step of unknowing things, and as you enter the unknown, you'll see it is not a place. It is the living reality of things underneath the idea of the unknown. The point is not to spend the rest of your life saying, I do not know to everything, 
it is to step out of the known and directly perceive. You do this by entering the lived reality of not knowing, which takes you out of the known, out of the idea and into the reality of you, of anything, and of anyone. It's a place where words are useful tools, but you are no longer trapped by them. This adult world has an insane quality to it. Everybody's going around pretending like they really know things, pretending like they know what's real and what's not, pretending they know what's right, pretending they know who's wrong, but actually nobody really knows. But this is something we're afraid of. We don't really want to admit that nobody really knows. As Jesus says, the kingdom of the Father is spread out upon earth, and men do not see it. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus says, there is light within a man of light, and he lights up the whole world. I didn't make the calling happen, I couldn't pretend it didn't happen, and I couldn't have turned it off even if I'd wanted to. It was disconcerting. And sure enough, my intuition was true, the entire trajectory of my life had changed at that instant. L. It is universal spirit or universal consciousness that wakes up to itself. Rather than the me waking up, what we are wakes up from the me. What we are wakes up from the seeker. What we are wakes up from the seeking, it's as if you wake up from the dream of thinking that you're already awake in your ordinary waking state. When you are spiritually awakened, what you thought was an awake state now seems like a dream. True meditation has no direction or goal. It is pure wordless surrender, pure silent prayer. All methods aiming at achieving a certain state of mind are limited, impermanent, and conditioned. Fascination with states lead only to bondage and dependency. True meditation is abidance as primordial awareness. We cannot storm the gates of heaven. Instead we must allow ourselves to become more and more disarmed. Then the pure consciousness of being becomes brighter and brighter, and we realize who we are. This brightness is what we are. True meditation is effortless stillness, abidance as primordial being.